I love movies. I love to watch movies. I love to watch reports about movies, study movies. I think film plays a really important role in our culture. And and one of the reasons I have that conviction is because of the the role that it plays in shaping people and society. Like, Like a long time ago, you think about it, people used to sit around a fire and they would tell stories. You know, those stories would say something about the world around us. It would say something about who we are and what our fears are. And, and, and these stories would help inform our worldview and shape us. And that's the role that movies and television play today. They are cultural texts. They, they are things that shape our view and our understanding of the world around us. So when you start to look at the movies that people are producing and studios are cranking out, and, and in particular at the movies that people are paying a lot of money to see, you start to gather a little bit of information about our culture, about our society, and what's important to us. And with that in mind, I want to talk about three film franchises real quick this morning because they all work together to say something interesting about our society. The first is called Paranormal Activity. And this is a series of six films. Uh, it's about supernatural stuff. It's a found footage film, meaning that everything looks like it's filmed from like a security camera or home video. It's supposed to add to the realism, but a lot of times it just makes you nauseous or gives you a headache. Uh, but anyway, these films, like I said, there's six of them, and they're all about people who live in these kind of haunted homes, areas, whatever, and it's either a ghost or a spirit or a demon, and, and it's just about the terror that they experience living in a place with a supernatural phenomenon around them. And these movies, six of them worldwide, on average, they've made $149 million each. So that's a lot of money people are paying to see films like this. The second series is called Insidious. And this is a series about a haunted house, haunted child. Again, spirits, demons, supernatural beings that just inflict terror and fear on the characters involved. There are four of these films. And on average, they've each made $135 million each. And then the last franchise I want to tell you about is probably the most successful of all of them. It's called The Conjuring. There's five of these films. They're loosely tied together. One is about a demon-possessed nun. One is about a demon-possessed doll. There might be two of those, actually. So one of them is a a demon-possessed house. Again, it's a movie, or series of movies, just about terror that we experience from the supernatural world. And again, on average, these movies have made a ton of money, $310 million each. So we look at these movies, there's a lot of them, a lot of money going in here, and what we start to see is that our society has a fascination with the supernatural, which is really kind of funny because we live in such an empirically biased culture. And when I say that, what I mean is if we can't see it, taste it, touch it, smell it, hear it, it doesn't exist. That's the way that a lot of of institutions and a lot of people in our society operate, and yet we pay a lot of money to go and experience this possibility, this openness to the supernatural. And that that openness, that curiosity we have, we experience that in different ways, sometimes in the terror we feel from a scary movie. Other times, though, it's from the fear that we feel when we start to consider that these spiritual things might genuinely exist. Sometimes spiritual stuff is scary. You are coming in on the second message of a four-part series called Bump in the Night. And this series is all about the stuff that we fear. Whether we want to admit it or not, we're all afraid of something. Some of us are afraid of spiders. Some of us are afraid of snakes or fire, clowns. Other fears are a little more serious and less obvious. Things like judgment or rejection or loneliness, death. We all have a fear of something. And these fears are very real. They're very formidable. But our God is even bigger, and we see that in our passage this morning in the book of Mark chapter 5. If you've got your Bibles with you, I want to ask that you open them up to Mark chapter 5. And if you don't have your Bible, don't sweat it. We have the passages on the side screens, or even better, download the YouVersion Bible app on your mobile device. It's Y-O-U version. It's free. It's a super, super awesome tool just to have with you all the time. I highly encourage you to download it and carry it with you. Mark chapter 5 is where we're going to be this morning. And this is the way it goes, starting in verse 1. It says, They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. So, 
Something kind of obvious, but probably we need to state it anyway. The guy in this story is kind of a scary dude. I don't know if you picked up on that, but like some details about him that kind of come together. He lives in a tomb. So like he hangs out and lives next door to dead bodies, which is not right. That's not normal. He's incredibly strong, so much so that he breaks chains and iron bindings that people have put on his feet. That's not normal. Regular people don't do that. But the icing on this creepy cupcake is his hobby. After a long day of being super strong and scary, he goes home to his tomb and he cuts himself with rocks and cries out in pain all night long. That's not normal. Like, there's a lot about this guy that's scary. Like, if you came across somebody like this on the street, what would you do? I mean, I think most of us would probably cross the street and walk on the other side at least, right? Like, we might come across somebody like this, and, and our natural instinct might be just to think, well, maybe they're mentally disturbed, maybe there's some sort of mental illness they're suffering from. And in fact, that's how a lot of people have approached this story in this passage in the past. They look at this and they say, well, there's some sort of psychological issue at play here. And you know what? That might make sense if this is where the story stopped, but it keeps going. Look at verse 6. It says, when he saw Jesus from a distance, the man ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. When Jesus asked him, what's your name? Uh, My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs and the herd, about 2,000 in number. So we all know what that looks like, right? You've seen the trucks outside of Smithfield. About 2,000 hogs rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Okay, mental illness is a very real thing that a lot of people suffer from and seek treatment for. But this is not how you treat mental illness. I've never heard a physician a therapist, anybody say, okay, I understand what your ailment, here's what I want you to do. Go stand by a herd of pigs and yell until they run off a cliff and you should be good. That's not how you treat mental illness. This is not a story of healing. This is a story of Jesus encountering the spiritual reality of the world that we live in. And that can be kind of a scary thought. In fact, that's the first point we're going to touch on this morning. Sometimes admitting that all of this spiritual stuff might be real is scary. It's scary to admit that spiritual stuff really exists. Now, not all of it is scary, mind you. There's some of this that we're very open to. There's some of us that we very readily affirm, stuff like God. I mean, if you're here this morning, you're probably at least open to the idea that a God exists, and that's not really scary when you think about it. The the idea that there is this all-powerful, loving being who knows me intimately, who cares about me, and who wants the best for me, that's not scary. That's really comforting, actually. And if you're here this morning, even if you're kind of on the fence about some of this stuff, you know, you're probably at least open to the idea of heaven, you know, and that's not scary either, this thought that when I die, there is a place where I can go that, that I'll know peace and I'll know joy and all this suffering, all this pain will be gone. That's not a scary thought. That sounds pretty great, actually. And even this, this other stuff, you know, this, this angels, demons stuff, we, we might be on the fence about this. And I need you to know that if you feel that way, you're not alone, okay? We live in an empirically biased culture. Like I said, if we can't interact with it with our five senses. We have a predisposition that says it's not real, and that's shaped all of us to some extent. You know, I'm included in that. I'm a preacher. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I believe Jesus was raised from the dead. I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, and yet when it comes to this angel's demon stuff, for whatever reason, I struggle at times to accept it. And I might fall into that camp of of people that say this is something else, if not for two things. One was a personal experience with this stuff that I can't explain any other way, And the other was this realization that that Jesus made this world, and I think he knows this world better than I do, and he seems to be affirming that that this stuff exists. You know, some of it's not scary. God, heaven, all of it sounds great. But that's kind of where the rub is. Because if some of this exists, then all of it exists. 
like this spiritual stuff. It's kind of an all or nothing proposition. We don't just get to pick the parts that we really like and hold on to those because they're more palatable and reject the rest of it. It's kind of like a, a night this week, my, uh, my family and I were sitting around the table. I have a two-year-old son named Levi. We were eating pasta and Caesar salad. And Levi has never really enjoyed Caesar salad, but he seemed like he wanted some. And he kept reaching for it, so we put some on his plate. And he took a couple pieces of lettuce and he put it in his mouth and he went, <laughs> just sucked all the dressing off of it. And when he was done, he went, <laughs> and just spat lettuce out all over the table. And I was like, dude, that's not how dinner works, okay? You don't just get to eat the dressing and spit the lettuce out because you don't like it. It's an all or nothing thing. And that's the way that this spiritual stuff is. It's an all or nothing proposition. We don't just get to pick bits and pieces because we like them. And that can be kind of scary because it means that if God is real, then there really is this spiritual reality around us that, that I can't influence or control by traditional means, that the universe is a whole lot bigger than I ever realized, and that that can be a very humbling experience, but it can also be kind of a scary experience to think, man, there is a lot of stuff out there that I don't understand. If heaven is real, that means that the alternative is real as well. And that's kind of a scary thought. This idea that I could have this eternity of bliss with God and joy and no pain, or there might be this other place that we call hell. The idea that that's real can be scary sometimes. And we all like the idea that everybody goes to heaven regardless no matter what, but the problem is nothing that God has ever told any of his people from Old Testament to New Testament seems to indicate this. I wish all dogs went to heaven and that hell was just a place for really, really, really bad people like Hitler, but that just doesn't seem to be the case. In fact, when you read what Jesus actually does have to say about hell, some of it is kind of chilling. You look at Matthew chapter 5, for instance, verse 21. He says, you've heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. And we're probably on board with this so far. People that kill other people, there is judgment to be had. But then he goes on to verse 22, he says, But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, You fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Did you get that last part? That's kind of a scary realization because I don't know about you, I've called people way worse than You fool, right? Those are some of the kinder things I may have said in a past life. Like, this is kind of scary. If heaven is real, that means that hell is real too. And if Jesus really did die on the cross to rescue me from sin and death and hell, if he really did have to lay down his life to save mine, that means that this sin business is real as well. That there is objective right and objective wrong, and that God is the decider of what is what. It means that my actions, my choices, and my life, they do matter. That he does care. They do have repercussions in this spiritual reality. That can be kind of a scary thought, too, because none of us in here have run a perfect race. You feel me? We've all stumbled and fallen at some different point. And that brings up another fear that this spiritual stuff sometimes wells up inside of us. Sometimes it's scary to admit, I failed. It's scary to admit I'm not good enough. I've not measured up. I mean, if there is this possibility of bliss or banishment and the deciding factor is my life and my choices and my actions and, and whether or not they line up with God, we're all hosed, right? I mean, the book of Romans, it tells us as much in Romans 3.23, it says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have fallen short. I mean, if you don't believe that, just think about yesterday for a minute. Think about your yesterday. Can you honestly say that all of your words were kind and gracious and patient? That all of your words built people up and respected the dignity of other people? That all of your thoughts were pure and led you down a path of being a better, holier person? Probably not, right? If for normal people like us, you probably woke up and the second you got out of bed, it was all downhill from there. Because it's hard to live that perfect life. I went to a wedding yesterday, and I can tell you, not all of my words were pure because it was cold outside. I was frustrated. I said, you know what? They got to cancel this wedding because it's just too cold outside. 
there was a girl that wore a dress. Man, she was brave because it was short. It was frigid. And I thought, man, can you believe she's wearing that today? A little judgmental, right? None of us are perfect. And when we think back to yesterday, we can all probably point to a moment where we say, yep, that's a Romans 3.23 moment. That's where I sinned. And that's where I failed to measure up to the standard that God calls me to. And that was one day in the many, many, many days that we live in this world. We've all sinned, and that can be kind of a scary thing. And that fear of failure, that fear of not measuring up, it can cause us to ask some dangerous and destructive questions. Like, how do I know God will really forgive me? How do I know he's actually going to stay true to his word? How do I know later down the road he's not going to just say, yeah, you know what, they were a little too bad. I'm going to remember their sins now. And we can start to just pile guilt and shame and at the end of the day, fear on ourselves, this fear of judgment. And that can have consequences, guys, not just in our spiritual walk, but on the quality, the psychological health, the emotional health of our entire life. I used to do youth ministry, and, and when I did, I took, a, I took our kids to a CIY conference. It's this big week-long conference for teenagers. You get a couple hundred teenagers in the room. It's, it's a ton of fun. It's exhausting, but it's fun. And every year at these conferences, they would try to have this interactive element to their worship. Like one year, you, know, you could go down front, and you could write a prayer on a piece of paper and, and put it in a wall, and that was something you could do during the song, just something to emphasize and engage people. This particular year, they had a, a, a beam of wood at the front of the stage, and there were some chains on it. And you could go down front, and they invited the kids to wrap the chains around their arms and then let them fall off, kind of as this, this visceral experience of what Jesus has done for them. And I'll be honest, I was a little cynical. I thought it was kind of lame. And I was talking to my buddy who worked for the company, and he kind of thought it was lame, too, until one week... He saw a 16, 17-year-old boy go forward, and he knew this boy, and he knew what the boy had done and what he was involved in, and he knew what had been done to this boy, so he knew that there were some issues here. And the 16, 17-year-old boy, he goes down to the front, he grabs those chains, and he just wraps it around his wrist till almost his fingers were purple, and just squeezes them as tight as he could. And he squeezed until his arms started to shake. And he started to cry, he started to yell, and he just couldn't let go of those chains. And my buddy realized that everything he was seeing in that picture was how this kid felt inside. All that guilt, that shame, that fear of what if I'm not good enough, what if I don't measure up, what if God doesn't forgive me, all of that were just shackles on this kid holding him down. And that's what this fear does to us, y'all. It puts us in chains. And it causes us to overlook the greatest gift that God has ever given us, the gift of Christ and the freedom that comes through him. You see, because of Jesus, we don't need to be afraid of spiritual stuff. We don't need to fear this spiritual reality, any part of it. Listen to how our story ends. In Mark chapter 5, verse 14, it says, Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. And, And then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. So let me back this up and paint a picture for you. So they hear this 2,000 number of pigs run off a cliff. That's not a sound you can miss, okay? Squeal and die and everything else. That got some attention. People came to check it out. And when they got there, they saw this scary dude sitting there, fully clothed, in his right mind, eating some soup or something. Just like, hey, what's up? Being completely normal. And then they look at Jesus, and they start to piece together what's happened, and when they realize what Jesus has done, they shudder to the bone. And they're not afraid of the demon-possessed guy anymore. They're afraid of Jesus, because they've started to catch a glimpse of who he is. And they say to Jesus, they begin to beg him, dude, we can deal with demons, we know how to handle that, but you, you are something else altogether. You got to go, man. Like, Jesus is not intimidated by any of this spiritual stuff. 
And when I say that, I'm not just talking angels, demons. I'm not just talking the devil and hell. I'm talking all of it. Jesus is not intimidated by our sin. He's not intimidated by our guilt. He's not intimidated by our past. He's not intimidated by our shame. In fact, the whole reason he came was to abolish and conquer all of that. He's not intimidated by the spiritual stuff. Listen to the way that the book of Hebrews describes this. It says, since the children, and that's you and me, by the way, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity. So that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery, who were in chains by their fear of death. The whole reason Jesus came to this world was to show who was in charge. It's not these spiritual powers, it's not fear, it's not sin, it's not even death. It's by the cross Jesus broke death. He shattered the power of hell. He defeated Satan. He is bigger than our sin. He's bigger than our guilt. He's bigger than our shame. He's bigger than the chains of fear that hold us down and suck the joy out of this life that God has given us. That's who he is. That's what he came to do. And so long as we stand beside him and follow him, church, we don't need to be afraid of this spiritual stuff. Did you notice how the demon-possessed guy addressed Jesus at the beginning of the story? The demons come and they beg him. They beg him, Jesus, don't torture us. Don't cast us out. They are terrified of him because they know who he is. They know what he can do. They know what he came to do. And church, when we start to understand who he is and we start to believe that he came to accomplish this mission to set us free, we don't need to be afraid. We just need to follow. And this morning, that's what I want to encourage you to do is to follow this incredible Jesus, this vastly powerful Savior who is bigger than any of this spiritual stuff that we might come into contact with. And if you've not made that decision to follow him, I want to tell you this morning is a great time to start because there is life and there is freedom and there's courage and there's boldness and there's forgiveness and love and joy and eternity that he's holding out for you to take a hold of. You just got to say yes. And this morning, if that's a decision you need to make and you need to make it, I want to invite you to take that connection card out of the back of the seat in front of you. And on the back, you'll find our next steps wheel. At the very top, there's the most important circle on that diagram. It says, choose Christ. Choose to follow. Choose to be saved by him. Choose to invite him into your life to be your savior and your God. And you have nothing to fear in this life or the next. If that's a decision you need to make, fill out that card. Bring it to me at this side table after service because we're going to talk about what it means to follow Jesus, to be baptized into him, and to follow him for the rest of your life. For the rest of us who've already made that decision, we're not off the hook because following Jesus is more than just a one-time decision. It's getting up every single day and saying, I'm going to take my next step towards you. And for you, I want to share how this story ends with the demon-possessed man. Verse 18, it says, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but he said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis, which is the 10 cities, began to tell how much Jesus had done for him and all the people were amazed. If you want to follow Jesus and you've already been baptized, here's the next step. Go tell people what he's done. Don't be afraid to tell them about the amazing things that Jesus has done. Don't be afraid to tell them about this gift of life and forgiveness that you have through him and only him. Don't be afraid to tell people that there are spiritual realities at play and he is the only one big enough to hold them at bay. Don't be afraid to tell people about Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Christ and thank you for what he has done to save us and to rescue us. We thank you for the power and the boldness that comes only through his name. And Father, as we leave this place, I pray that we would go as salt and light in this world, that we would go to tell people about the truth, to tell them about life, to tell them about hope, and to tell them about the gifts that only come through your son. Jesus, we praise you for your boldness, for your power, for your authority, for your vastness, and mostly for your love and coming to save us. And it's in your name we pray these things. Amen.